Okay, so at this point, we've talked about the basics of Java 8. We talked about lambda expressions and method references and a little bit about functional interfaces. We've also talked about the basics of Java streams, sequential streams, aggregate operations, intermediate operations, terminal operations, some of the various examples of those, map and filter and flat map a little bit. Uh, and of course, we talked about collect and reduce and for each a little bit. What we're going to do now is move to the next phase where things hopefully get much more interesting because we're going to start talking about concurrency and, and parallelism. And what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about how Java 8 allows you to apply these functional programming features to in concert or to amplify or augment or supplement or better utilize the concurrency and parallelism frameworks that it provides. And these will be parallel streams, which are streams on steroids because they can run in parallel. And we'll talk a bit about that. And then the other thing are these things called completable futures, which are ways of being able to run operations asynchronously and then have various completion stages that are invoked after they're done. I'll also give you an overview of some case studies that we'll be looking at, some of which you've seen in a earlier guise, and others of which we'll talk about showing off these other features. So Java 8 adds two new frameworks that are related to functional programming. They deal with concurrency and parallelism. Remember, we talked before about the difference between parallelism and concurrency, where concurrency is really about sort of running things in the background and offloading work from the UI thread or the user interface thread. And parallelism is about actually running things at the same time after they've been partitioned uh, into smaller chunks. They can, those chunks can then be executed in multiple cores, and the results can be reassembled and joined back together again. So that's kind of the big picture view. So one of the things that are provided are parallel streams. And there are a couple things that a parallel stream does. The first thing that they do is they partition a stream into multiple substreams using splitterators, especially parallel splitterators, as we'll talk about later. And then these, these chunks that are broken up into pieces can be run independently. In other words, they can run in multiple threads or multiple cores. And after they're done, they can be joined together into a reduced result. So the key point there is that these substreams or these chunks of data can automatically be mapped to multiple threads and multiple cores. So that's what the parallel streams framework is going to do. And what you're going to find when you do your next programming assignment, assignment 2B, is you'll take assignment 2A and you'll make a few little tweaks to it because I want to add a couple extra things and I want to introduce the cool new skeletons that we'll have shortly. And then when you have done those minor cosmetic changes and added in a little bit more intelligence in one of the functions, all you should have to do, knock on wood, is go replace your dot .stream with your dot .parallel stream, and all of a sudden everything will run a lot faster because it'll just automatically parallelize itself. So that's pretty cool, and hopefully that'll come across well when we get to that point. So parallel streams, the, the way to think about a parallel stream, it's basically a fine-grained data parallelism programming model. So fine-grained can mean you can have you know, lots of cores that are mapped to the data elements in the stream, and they can all run in parallel after they've been split. Completable futures are a little bit trickier. So here's what the syntax, the visualization means. And I'll come back and cover this later in more detail. So um, do, you know, do you know what these funky things are? What, what is this? There's a name for them, believe it or not. A table tent, exactly. Yes. How did you know that, by the way? You have what? Perfect. So you, <laughs> you probably also, if you go to Wendy's or other restaurants, you'll get a table tent. You know, when you order your order, when you make your order, they will hand you one of these things, and then your order will be cooked and brought out to you at your table, right? So it's called a table tent. Um, you also see them a lot at, you know, like weddings and stuff like that. These are table tent numbers. So what this means here is this is basically a future. If you ever stop to think about what is a table tent, a table tent is a promise that your order will be delivered to you even though you didn't get it when you placed your order, right? So it's, it's a future for the purposes of our discussion. So in this context, this is basically a, this is actually very similar to your assignment. It's going to count the number of images that are available on a web page or accessible through that web page. 
So we have a method here called supply async, which is a completable future method. And what it does is it's going to go out and it's going to synchronously download a page. Get start page is, is a synchronous call, but we're going to run it asynchronously in a background thread via supply async. And what supply async returns is a future to the page. So in other words, while it's downloading the page, it gives you back a table tent, a future, that you can then use to program the rest of your app while the download is taking place. And, and I represent that in my somewhat half-baked uh, visualization as a table tent, right? So page is kind of like a future, and that's the table tent, the angle brackets, you know, the angle slashes say, this is like a future, like our table tent. So we end up with a future to a uh, page. And then we can write the rest of our program as follows. So um, this chunk of code can run in parallel to this chunk of code. So this chunk of code says, when the table tent, when the future for the page completes, then asynchronously count the number of images on the page and return a future to that result. So Im image num, image number, is a future that will become completed when we're done counting the images, which runs asynchronously, by the way. And over here, we're going to go ahead and asynchronously crawl the hyperlinks on the page. And then we're going to return a completable future to an array of integers that correspond to the counts of all the images accessible via the hyperlinks on the page. So notice in both cases, this page future, which we got up here, will be used. And this code basically says, when this future completes, then do these things asynchronously. So what you can see we're doing here is we're making ourselves a dependency graph of asynchronous operations. And we're using these completable futures as a way to write code that can continue to make progress when the asynchronous operations are done. And then down here, so th notice this is basically a fork. We're, we're forking off two things that can run asynchronously in parallel. And then down here, we're joining those results back together by using a then combine operation. So then combine says, when this future is done and all these futures are done, or this future to all these futures are done, combine the results and sum up the count of the number of images. So we'll, we'll go through this syntax, and you'll see the Java code in more detail later. But that's basically what it's doing. It's allowing you to asynchronously program computations that are triggered when other asynchronous operations complete. So that's what a completable future allows you to do. And oh, by the way, you can also use this stuff in conjunction with a pool of worker threads. So we have a pool of worker threads, and all these computations can run asynchronously in this pool of threads. And if the, the processor supports multiple cores, then those threads can be running in multiple cores, and you can get everything basically going at the same time. So it's, it's a wildly different programming model than the streams and parallel streams approach, because it's asynchronous, whereas the streams and parallel streams approach is synchronous. And as a general rule of thumb, it's easier to write synchronous code but also as a general rule of thumb, asynchronous computations run a lot faster often. So we'll see some examples of both those things. It turns out you can combine these things together like peanut butter and chocolate. You can have streams with completable futures and the end result is super cool and very effective. One of the things you'll notice as we start doing all this is that the application code you write often doesn't require any changes with respect to synchronization or explicit threading. So you typically do not have to write code to acquire and release locks. You typically don't have to spawn any threads. All that stuff is handled for you by the frameworks. Now, that doesn't always work out, but that is often the case. And I think for the examples we'll be doing here, that will certainly be the case. And why is that nice? Because many accidental and inherent complexities of concurrency and parallelism just evaporate entirely because you've got programs that by design are embarrassingly parallel, so there's no need to have to lock anything. Arturo, please shut the computer.
OK. Under the hood, both frameworks are going to use the fork join pool framework. We're going to talk more about that. That's kind of the brains of the whole thing. And it's what does the splitting and joining and parallel computation very efficiently. And part of the secret sauce of the fork join framework is something that's called the work stealing algorithm. And it's a really clever technique that is used extensively, which you can learn about here. And what it does is it basically maps the work to be done onto a set of queues. They're actually called decks for double-ended queues. And these decks are managed, each deck is managed by a separate thread in the pool. And the way it works is when a thread has no more work on its deck, in other words, it's got nothing else to do, rather than just sit there and block, it will randomly try to go to somebody else's deck and steal work from their deck. And if it's done properly, you end up with very low contention, and you keep the cores busy all the time, which is really cool. So that, that way, you maximize utilization, and something's always running. So that's one of the goals for fine-grained parallelism, because we want to have lots of work to be handled by the threads in the pool, which under the hood map to cores, right? So the idea is to maximize throughput. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of different examples. We're going to take our search stream gang, and we're going to kind of <clears throat> bling it out a little bit so it'll work with parallel streams instead of just sequential streams. And you'll see that there's a big boost in performance as a result of that. And then we're also going to look at something else called the image stream gang case study. And this is another really cool thing. It's not unlike the program that you're doing for assignment two, where you're downloading files. But we'll show off all kinds of interesting features for that. OK, so that's the end of the introduction section.